I personally don't care about the exit. I care about, you know, your commitment level. Do you believe in it? Why are you doing it? And the exit up front is almost a negative signal to me. Welcome to the Susan Sly Project, where entrepreneurs rule, startups launch, and the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Susan Sly. Well, hey, everyone. If you are living in your parents' basement, then this is going to be the episode for you. No, I'm just kidding, but maybe not really. So wherever you are in the world, hey, I want to give some shouts out to Germany, Poland, who are now in the top 10. I love you guys. I haven't been to Poland, but I've been to Germany many times. Anyway, my guest today is the executive chair and co-founder of a company that is really changing how we look at accounting. And I know what some of you are thinking, accounting, oh my gosh, but don't forget the number one reason businesses fail is poor cash flow. And uh, why is that? It's because people don't understand their accounting and being married to an accountant. I think accounting is pretty sexy. Actually, I do. Anyway, um, this software was designed exclusively for freelancers and the growing service base um, for business owners. And this gentleman built the basement. It built his business out of the basement. And since launching in 2003, over 24 million people have used his software, FreshBooks, to save time on billing and collect billions of dollars. But one of my favorite things about this gentleman is not that he's a father, not that he's a loving husband, not that he's enduring a renovation. He is a fellow Canadian from my hometown, Toronto, Canada, and Drake as well, who's from Toronto. So Mike McDermott, thanks so much for being here. You look carefully. There's Canadians everywhere. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. We're, we are everywhere. <laughs> I, so Mike, I want to ask you just jumping in, you know, there are so many people who listen to the show, whether they're in Nigeria or they're in Christchurch or wherever it is they are, they're thinking of starting a business. What was the first business you started? Um, the, the short answer is the, I will wash your car with my parents' hose in my parents' driveway, you know, after school, um, for five bucks business. Uh, that was, that was, that was probably the, the first one, I guess, you know, maybe I hadn't thought about it, but maybe the, the, the lemonade stand came before that. Um, I got a lesson in that my, my best friend's mother was like, you know, we used all her stuff. We had a cookie tray and we had, we had lemonade out there. And at the end of the day, she was like, okay, great. How much did you make? And we were like, you know, I don't know. You, seven dollars and she's like okay i'll take 550 back those were my cookies and my lemonade you made a buck 50 split it between yourselves <laughs> and i was like what <laughs> okay uh what happened and she's like we gotta buy this stuff so so that was maybe that's that's an even better answer to that question uh all, all of it true but that that was probably the first one and and when was it you know i had um it, um, Luke Aberley, who's a 12 year old entrepreneur from uh, Alberta on the show. And I asked him this question um, because it's a difference when we actually start our first business to when entrepreneurship gets into our blood. So when do you feel that you, you actually said, I want to be an entrepreneur? Well, that, that's an interesting uh, thing, at least from my point of view. And I'll, I'll give you a bit of a, a longer one on this. Cause I think, mm. I think I may be like, or other people may, may be like me. So um, I think that, that washing the car thing was in grade two. Um, the, uh, the, the lemonade stand may have been before. That one almost doesn't count because it's so obvious everybody does that for a day uh, at least. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but also like in grade two, the parent-teacher night, I drew a video game on the, uh, the board. I made this like game and instead of asking like, do you like it or whatever? I asked, how much would you pay for this? Mm. <laughs> which, which is maybe, a, maybe a sign. Now you might say, Oh, Mike, it was obvious to you. You were going to be an entrepreneur, but to be honest, it was not at all. Uh, and that what I, my experience was growing up is it just didn't seem like an obvious path. There weren't entrepreneurship, at least where I grew up in, in Toronto, Canada, there were entrepreneurs, many great ones for sure, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that was heralded. Um, I feel like the U S as I travel, entrepreneurship is more heralded than it is in, you know, in my hometown there. I, I feel like these tech entrepreneurs like Zuckerberg and what have you have gone and made it again, like a thing to go start a company. When I was growing up, it was like, go work for Goldman Sachs or Lehman Brothers, and that's the height of what you can do. And now it's like, go, go start a company, which I think is in many ways much healthier. 
Um, so the long and the short of it is, yeah, in grade 12, my mom put uh, you know, a book about being an entrepreneur, like entrepreneurship for dummies in my stocking. And I was, I was like, what is it? Like, why did you even give this to me? And like, I didn't, I didn't see the connection, but I think she knew uh, where things were heading before I did. And so, you know, I, I think it's a, you know, I, I believe it's not an obvious path for a lot of people, but uh, I think it was, you know, my nature from pretty early on. Mm. And your mom, clearly it was, she had, she saw something in you that beyond the lemonade stand and beyond the, the washing the cars, but she definitely saw something, which was huge when you, you know, and, and to the point of, and we have people of all ages who listen to the show and watch the show. Um, and it depends on how old someone is to really understand when I was, when I went to Brockville Collegiate Institute, Mike, in the Mm -hmm. 80s. Sure. So you do those, um, the, the career tests and mine was, I think secretary was the one that I, I got. I think Did you one do one? The, one of the many ones might've had janitor. There was like really high. It was fascinating to me. Like there was a range. It was like, well, this is what you'd probably like. And it was for everything from like probably executive though. I don't really remember to, I do remember janitor and it, it was like, wow. Okay. Still not really helping me narrow it down. <laughs> Yeah. And it was, it was such a, a, you know, just to, to share some stories too. It was, it was a different time because there was this, and I don't know, I'm curious about this. So when, when I was growing up, I was from an entrepreneurial family. So my dad and my grandmother owned a restaurant and my dad was a serial entrepreneur. He was an engineer, an inventor. My husband, on the other hand, his father uh, worked for the government. At one point he ran Omer's, which if you don't know what Omer's is, it's the um, Ontario Municipal Employees Pension. And, And it was at one time the largest pension in the entire world. And he was like this government guy. And so my husband was taught, go to school, get good grades, get a government job for $50,000, work until you get a pension. And I was taught you have to make your own way. So what, as you were growing up beyond your mom, what were some of the messages that you were hearing? Because those, the narrative I think has changed. Now we see a lot of young people starting businesses, but what was the narrative for you? Um, I I don't know that there was much of a narrative um, for me. I think I remember I have a, a, a friend, I'll call her a friend now, she's about 99, and she lived next door to me, and she's still with us, fortunately, uh, oh, not next door gosh. anymore. But uh, but she she tells the story of how I came by in my 20s, and I was sitting in her, we were catching up, and I was hanging out with her, and, and she was like, Mike, you could not have told me what you wanted to do. But you had a long list of the things you didn't want to do. And so, mm-hmm. again, back to trying to figure it out, it was stumbling around knowing, you know, like, I, I went to business school for a few years, and I had no desire, like I did not want to be in my study groups. Like I didn't really enjoy the culture of business school. I didn't want to grow up and be kind of a middle manager in a bank or, you know, or even go to like investment. It just wasn't appealing to me. That all felt, you know, not like me. Uh, And so I, you know, I think a lot of it for me was finding something that fit. And those, again, those, those, what those things were, were not going to be obvious or sorry, Mm -hmm. were really not obvious. And, And my mom, interestingly, was quite entrepreneurial, but more in the, you know, not-for-profit sector starting things up. So she was, she was behaving in an entrepreneurial way, but not, um, not in a commercially um, oriented uh, way. Mm, That's interesting. Which school did you go to? Um, I did, I did business school at Queens until fourth year when I left the program and started two businesses. (laughs) What year was that? Oh dear, you're going to date me here. That's just fine. Um, I was, I was a 99. So that would have been whatever that was. I don't even know what that was. What's it was the 99 the start year or the graduating years, the graduating year. So it probably would have been 98. So I did my last credit at Queens in 92. So I'm going to date myself. (laughs) (laughs) So Mike, the let's, let's fast forward time. When you had the concept for fresh books, um, what were you, what were you doing at that time? Because so many people have ideas, but they don't act on them. And I'm very, what I'm really curious about is what in an entrepreneur's mind, that's why we call it raw and real entrepreneurship. What, what is it about that person that je ne sais quoi, where they are like, I have an idea, but I'm actually going to take action. So what was going on in your life? How did you get the idea and, and what compelled you to say, I have to do this no matter what? Yeah, the, the motivation. So, um, uh, by the way, that that was 
Oh, we'll get to it, but that wasn't really the thing. Um, I, I, I'm pretty intuitive. If I look back on my career to date, mm-hmm. I can make sense of it all. At the time, I, I couldn't make sense of it. So to, to the starting of FreshBooks was I had through a series of things, leaving you know, business school in fourth year, starting two businesses. One of them was an events business. You know, The caterer for that event needed a website. I started building websites to market the events. And then I started building it for my caterer. And then I had a bunch of clients and I was using Word and Excel to build them. I saved over an invoice and uh, said, hey, there's got to be a better way. And so getting into this business was an intuitive thing because I was helping build websites and uh, wanted to get into showing our customers, hey, we can build applications for you as well. And so I said, well, why don't I start? And I saved all this invoice. I was very frustrated. I had basically a shrink wrap box of software on my shelf that I knew, even though I went to business school, I would, you know, really not enjoy using. So I said, forget it. I'm going to build something. I'm going to show my clients, A, what I can build and give them a simple experience to get their invoice. And that's how we started. So I scratched my own itch solving the thing for myself. And it was kind of an intellectual curiosity and challenge to me um, to, 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 to do it. And that's, that's why I did it. It didn't have like a big vision for where it was going to go or anything like that. And I think if you scratch under a lot of entrepreneurs, they are project people and the best people that I like to hire, they, they get into a project. They actually, they do execute on a small scale even, and then think about, you know, like, Oh, do I like doing this? And so for me, it was, Hey, I did it. And I really liked doing it. So my vision for what that little thing could be kept growing. And then our our clients who got the invoices liked it. And we started to realize, you know, there other people would benefit from this too. So it was a, again, a very intuitive process for me, but um, you know, it, it clicked. I love that, that I love what you said. I wrote that down that, that a lot of entrepreneurs are project people, right? And there's that, that piece where execution becomes essential. And I sit on a board of a Canadian startup right now. And the, the, one of the principles that just, you know, it's constant. It's like, okay, should we focus on the UX? Should we focus on the UI? Should we do this? Should we do this? And, and I had a meeting with him actually today. And I was like, at some point you have to step out of the boat and walk, right. And just jump in. And that's what you have to do. So how did you, how did you scale? Because there are a lot of people out there who get a few clients. It's, it's one thing that I have a few clients, maybe I have a 10 or 12 clients, but how did you begin to scale? By sticking with it is the short answer. Mm. Um, we were after two years making a hundred dollars a month mm. and we had 10 customers paying us nine ninety five, And I had the, I still had the services business and that was kind of, you know, what was paying the bills, but I really had, it was, this was a passion project is another way to put it. So mm. loved it, kept working with it, but then we just kept finding ways to improve. We had thousands of people signing up each month, but very few of them turning into paying customers. And so, oh, our pricing and packaging was wrong. Well, we didn't know anything about pricing and packaging. <clears throat> so we had to kind of invent that because it was not common to buy a subscription software online in 2004. Uh, so, so that th- these are the the kinds of things, and, and and we just we basically just stuck with it and and kept iterating and iterating and iterating and not holding ourselves to account to be on anyone else's timeline for, you know, are we there yet and successful or even their definition of success because commercially we were a flop. But if you look at the growth of users, like this was. You know, it was you know extraordinarily fast growth happening kind of month over month, and so we knew something was there. We just hadn't figured out how to turn it into a business yet. I love that you're so transparent about the numbers because there are a lot of people who look at startups the way a lot of people are looking at you know crypto or meme stocks or whatever. It's like I'm going to do a startup and I'm going to make all this money. Two years. You're, you're not even making $500 a month. At what point did you start to seek out funding to scale? Well, the truth is we avoided it. So, you know, seeing as I were, you know, air quotes, contemporaries for, uh, and I don't know if you got into the business or startup community in, um, in, in Toronto around that time when you were at Kingston for a while, it sounds like. So Hummingbird was a thing. And in many ways, mm-hmm. Kingston was more successful because some good startup companies were there. We had a, um, you know, a vulture capital community in Toronto that I was, I was terrified of. Um, for those of you who are raising money or thinking about it today, the world is a much better place for entrepreneurs than it was, say, a couple of decades ago. Back then, the internet didn't exist. 
and there was this huge information arbitrage between the entrepreneurs and the VCs for, for what like a, a reasonable deal term would be and all these kinds of things. And so venture capitalists just took advantage of entrepreneurs at every turn. And, and to be honest, I think, you know, shortchanged themselves in the process because they created dynamics where it's like, okay, here's $300,000, I'll take 60% of your company. And then pretty soon the entrepreneur doesn't have much reason to go on. All of a sudden, they're sort of actually not in control. So no one's listening to their vision for how to get there. And, you know, the, the potential of these companies really gets thwarted and, and kind of snubbed and, and shortchanged. And, and nobody has a good experience. The venture capitalist doesn't make money. The, the entrepreneur is like, I just spent my time and I hate these people and I'm miserable about it. Maybe they turn that into doing it again and learning from it. But it's um, it was a bit of a racket. And so... I, we basically kind of avoided that. Um, we did a little bit of angel financing. Um, we almost raised from, a, you know, I think, a good angel group, not the vulture capitalist, $300,000 $300, for a third of the company. I maintain that we would have gone out of business a long time ago had we done that um, mm -hmm. because we would have you know, had this significant stake standing out there from people who, you know, frankly, the space, they would have been too early because we were too early. The space was not well understood, like all these kinds of things. And so it's it's funny how these things turn out. But the point is, I didn't rush to it. It was over a decade before we took on, you know, institutional capital. We've since raised, you know, a couple hundred million dollars, all that good stuff. But yeah. but it is, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was not, it was, it, it took a while. I put it off kind of as long as I could and stuck to friendlies. So family money, as in like $10,000 from my parents, uh, which they were like, okay, I guess we're just pissing this away, pardon my French, and not expecting <laughs> to get anything back. And then uh, my, my best friend's father um, started to advise, and then he put like, I don't know, $40,000 in. And so that these were the, the quantums of capital over like long periods of time. And we were, uh, I used the consulting business to put some dollars in, and then eventually we found a somebody from the technology industry who was an angel investor. So it was, it was, we kind of built up to it. And I, I actually think that was great because we wouldn't have known what to do with the capital um, if we had it any sooner. Yeah. And thank you for, thank you for sharing all of that because it's, it's that, that grind of how much money do we need? What are we willing to give away for it? Do we do debt-based financing? Do we qualify for debt-based financing? And it just keeps going, you know, round and round with radios. Um, we did 7.1 million in friends and family. And it's kind of this funny thing in Silicon Valley because they're like, you did 7.1 million in friends and family. And I'm like, if you're a good person and you know a lot of people and you can cast a vision, people invest in the founders more so than the technology at that early stage. And then, you know, the the other question I have for you, how did you attract because you were you were capital limited? Because I believe in my research, like the early iterations of FreshBooks, there, there was a freemium model. So you're bringing on users. And if people don't understand what that means, there's still a capital outlay to support those users. Um, who are not yet paying. So how did you attract really good people without being able to pay them really great salaries? Um, I, I think we focused on really loyal people who believed mm. in what we were doing. Um, you know, I, if I look at it, you know, my co-founders, one was a, a doctor in computer science. He loved the project. He had some extra time. He wanted some side work. Uh, and so side work, I think, is a key thing if you want really great people. And, and Joe is really great. Um, and then my, my another, we had another person who was um, Levi, who's our, the, we're the three uh, co-founders. And Levi joined, he was an electrical engineer, had been working in a consulting company, and he was just tired of it. Like he just, it was like, I don't like what I'm doing. This seems, you know, like, why not do this? These are good people. And, and so we solved for quality of character over, you know, sort of proven professional competency uh, which, you know, frankly, I wouldn't have had a clue how to assess at the time anyways. Uh, but I have no regrets about that. I, I think so much of this when you're in a startup is you're going to be in the same room with these people for more than you are with any of your family members. That includes like once you're married and all that stuff. Like it's, it's you know, like it, who do you spend 50 or more hours a week with? Like nobody. Um, so, so that's, uh, you know, it really matters who you get involved with. And our first employees were like, you know, Daniel, who's still with us and uh, he, um, he was, he had worked for another home-based business and he showed up at my parents' house for like two, three years. Cause we were working out of there for a while. So he was, you know, comfortable with it. It wasn't weird for him to, to join a company that operated out of a home where a lot of other people are like, where's your office? I can't work for you out of a home. And that was 
le- yeah, that's probably less of a thing today than it was back then, but that was very much a thing uh, in sort of 2004. Let, let me ask you this because you have now the wisdom you're in the executive chair position, you know, obviously, you know, co-founding a company that has a, a, a massive valuation, like unicorn valuation and, and we're talking U S dollar valuation. So for, <laughs> you know, that's like 1.3 billion Canadian. But my, my question for you is what does, what does 2021 Mike go back and advise 2003 Mike? Part of me wonders if it's not the other way around, um, uh, mm. which is a funny thing to say. I'll explain. But we, we were very first principles, everything very values oriented. You know, you know, I would say I was uncompromising in a whole bunch of things. And um, as you you know get up and you, like it's almost like sometimes I want to channel that self because that mm. self was kind of very driven, very nuts, you know, maybe a little bit directive, um, but, you know, had an answer, knew what he wanted to do was in, in many ways, like the, the intuition was high. And, um, and so, you know, having said that, if I sit here today and I look back, I'd say, hey, don't change much, like stick to your guns, um, you know, maybe learn how to incorporate other, you know, like, I, I think I struggled for years in terms of uh, not so much leading people, because that, you know, innately kind of came, but I think, you know, having them feel included sometimes in decision making and stuff like that, that you hear about, uh, you know, with founders sometimes in the early days, I can talk to you at length around why I think that happens. But I, I had to learn how to adjust my leadership style uh, to have it, you know, be more motivating for others. Um, uh, even though, th- you know, we didn't have anybody leave, like it's like they were bought in and a lot of people still with us, but I think I got sort of better at it over time. So I think that was the the thing. And, and it was, you know, to be honest, I, I don't look back and feel like I want to do things, you know, differently. Cause I don't know that I could have done much p- better than I did. I think, <laughs> uh, like, I think I was pushing myself on so many levels the whole time that I just had to wait to get to the next one to work on it, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. Yeah, I love what you said that it, it, you really you really had this foundation that was values-based. And to that point, a great leader stands on great values because in my research on you and what everyone needs to know is, is you know, you, you can look at layers of someone's background in the news and so on, and you go deep enough and you find something. And with Mike, there's not, you know, when he says he built the company in a way that was values based and there wasn't, you know, recently you decide to step back as CEO and, you know, after 18 years and, and that's, that's tough because this is like your child, right. That you co-parent with two others. Um, how was that decision for you emotionally? Did you have, a, a, was there any challenge with shifting your identity when you made that move? Yeah, I think uh, surprisingly little. Funnily enough, yesterday, I can't even remember the context, but somebody asked me, like, how was dinner? It was I was meeting with uh, someone, I was introduced to somebody, and I met them for the first time, and we had a great conversation, and, and we were talking a little bit about this whole transition, and he asked me, you know, how was the first dinner after you kind of announced, you know, the, this thing? And I was like, it was, you know, like, honestly... I don't even know how to answer that question because it was it was no different. I, I honestly am still doing the stuff in the CEO role that was the same. I, you know, there's been some misinterpretations in the media of like what actually happened, which have been frustrating. That's probably been the hardest part. Lost a bit of time this summer to, you know, fake news. But, um, you know, outside of that, um, honestly, for me, I ha- like, listen, I, I think I was very uh, thoughtful um, about having, uh, like, I believe in succession. You know, part of being a leader is, is being into succession. You don't hand in two weeks and, and sort of do whatever. And so for me, I got to um, invite a person into the organization who I worked with closely for two years, who I think is better fit to lead the company for the next you know, period of time, call it three, five, seven years. And you know, it was easy for me to toss the keys to that individual to have them just keep going, <laughs> go further. And you know, uh, you know, I was privileged to have the board, you know, do a lot of work to say, "Hey, Mike, we want you here as well." And um, and I get to just do all the stuff I love and drop a bunch mm-hmm. of the stuff that I didn't like as much. So so for me, you know, that's that that is not as much a thing. And I think 
you know, for founders who are out there, I think, you know, succession planning and getting out of the way and what have you is something that often goes poorly. Uh, and I think there are ways to do it and ways to think about it. And, you know, I'll have more on that in the future. I hope to share with others in hopes that they can navigate it. But I don't think it has to be a jarring, you know, identity loss event if you, uh, you know, if you if you are thoughtful about it and, and uh, you know, get get things in place. Well, and, and you're a person who's always led from my research with the philosophy of what's best for the company, what's best for the users, not what's best for Mike, right? And, and that, that, Mike, makes a huge difference. When, when startup founders come to me and they ask for my advice, one of the first things I'll say is, what is your exit plan? And they're like, but I'm just starting the business. And I'm like, I don't care. If you don't know what your exit plan is, it means your ego is too attached to this. And when it's time for you to leave, step down, move, whatever it is, you're not going to be in that position. And then also we could have a whole discussion on company structure, like living in America, there's like an infinite number of ways to structure in Canada. There's not, but, you know, thinking about that at the beginning from how you attract the right people, whether you use an ESOP or, you know, whatever it is you're using, how you plan for your succession. And when you find that person and they might come in early on in your hires, thinking about how do I nurture them and mentor them so I can step aside. And I think as founders that, you know, in my mind, and I love what you said, the greatest day for me is going to be when I'm no longer needed. And that's when I'm hiring. I'm always like, I want to hire people who are as good as me or better. Because at that yeah. point, I won't be needed. I, I, I just want to talk about this because I think it'd be easy for folks to, you know, sort of take away things that I, I, I wouldn't necessarily want them to on this. I, you know, by the way, I take a different point of view on this whole knowing about the exit in, in the first place. Mm. I actually would prefer that people go on the journey. I think the exit will find you if you're doing the right thing and you build something valuable. You'll have options, I believe. Great companies are bought, not sold. And so I, I personally don't care about the exit. I care about, you know, your commitment level. Do you believe in it? Why are you doing it? And the exit up front is almost a negative signal to me. So just for the audience, not to you know, yeah, disagree no on purpose, but it's I, I good. Think it's good, good to dialogue. have a different, a different perspective around it. Um, and then, and then, yeah. So, and then I also, you know, like, Hey, it's been two decades. I don't think there's been a better person to do it. I feel like I'm lucky to find somebody for this phase of the company's development. That's better. Uh, by the way, I don't know until this point that, you know, it would have been a good choice. And I think a lot of companies lose their way when the founder, you know, if the founder has been leading for a while, or even if not, you know, steps aside and, and doesn't have the right, you know, person or team in place. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I think a lot of people, I think a, a switch is flipped. It used to be like, oh, we can replace the founder and put in a manager. I, I think that's very wrong. Um, you know, a lot of times the founders understand the market, have a vision for the product in a way that you just can't bring in off the street. They'll know the team in the company and can help like, you know, fit things together. I, I've probably undervalued you know, that as an asset for, for developing the organization and, you know, sort of being successful with various strategies. So, so I do think there's a lot of value in the founder. Um, and I think to some extent, you know, I'm, I'm chair of another company and founder of another company as well, sort of five years in, there's another CEO who's one of my co-founders there. And, you know, like he, he knows, he's like, I got to get the company to another phase before I can go. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of more the mindset. It's it's like, hey, um, you probably need to get to some milestone. Um, and for me, it was kind of around the one we're at right now. I never really saw myself going beyond. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's 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 what it is. I you know, I, I like uh, that wasn't the reason how I got to it. But I when I think about it ten years ago, I was like, oh, if I get to about this phase, I can't see myself you know running a company uh, beyond that phase. So, anyways, I share all this because um, I think this stuff is is hard to figure out if you're starting a company. And I would almost go ahead and say, forget about this conversation if you're starting a company. Focus on your customer. Mm -hmm. Focus on your product, and you know, focus on you know building a culture that's going to be a good long-term thing for you and your, your, you know, your team, everything else is going to sort itself out. Uh, opinion. Mike. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that perspective. It's focusing on the right things. I do want to clarify why I mentioned the exit from a U.S. perspective as a Canadian living in the U S up until recently with tax changes, 
how someone was structured would determine how they exited here in the US, as I'm sure you're aware. So if you were like a Delaware C, the founders would get the QSBS treatment and their first 10 million on the exit would be tax-free. Those rules are going out the door. So for, for US-based startups, the one of the things I ask is, do you want to, do you intend to eventually sell or do you intend to um, have your employees assume the company somehow, or do you want to take it public? Because that's what I meant from a structural standpoint, but I a hundred percent agree with everything you say, but that's why I asked that because in Canada, there aren't the same structures, I guess. So, but to your point, I think that the summary is you've got to stand on your values. Like you said, you've got to attract and surround yourself with the right people. And, um, you know, as you've illustrated having this, this strong humility, because, you know, we see a lot of founders who don't, and that's never good for the company. Right. So let a rapid fire, let's finish this off. I'm going to throw some, uh, some questions at you. Um, is there a book that you read that, you know, someone who's, you know, sort of at that stage where they want to get their business going that you would recommend? Um, usually it's once you're going a little bit, but I often recommend The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good book to help you just think about the various roles. Like it's not one person, it's a team. And how do you get that kernel of a team? And there's some strengths you need. I, I think it was one of the, the best ways to realize you need to complement yourself with people. Um, and uh, there's certain kinds of people you need to compliment. So by the way, it starts with knowing who you are and which role you play and then finding other people to do those other roles. I think that's an invaluable lesson from that book. I love it. That's one that comes up a lot. So next question I have for you, Canadian question. If you had to pick a choice, like it was a, a mandatory either or beaver tail or poutine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I these days I go poutine, which is uh, you know, not the sugar. Yeah, beaver tails all sugary and whatever, and uh, go with the, the greasy gravy, potatoes and cheese. Yeah. Okay. Last question for you: um, favorite Canadian song? Um, I'll just I'll throw a catalog out there. It'll be Neil Young for me. Mm, all of Neil Young. Yeah. We could, I mean, pick an album, we can talk track by track, but uh, yeah, Neil's, Neil's in my, uh, my top three artists, uh, you know, all time and, and is Canadian and is, is a legend. And uh, there's another Canadian that probably lots of people think is American. So uh, there we go. Uh, I, I think that Neil Young, great choice. I'm still standing by um, the tragically hip because I have such a long history with the guys. Um, also a great Canadian band, <laughs> but either way, you will not go wrong at a cottage party with Neil Young or the Tragically Hip. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, Mike, um, I want to thank you so much for being here and I want to encourage everyone to go to freshbooks.com and uh, the software is incredible and uh, I love what you're doing, not just um, for your company, but for small business owners, it's just tremendous. So thank you so much for that. And if people want to follow you um, on social, I know you have many different handles. Um, your uh, the FreshBooks is on Instagram, on Twitter, you're Mike McDermott, um, and on Facebook for FreshBooks. But what is the preferred if they want to drop a comment after the show? If you want to get to me, probably at Mike McDermott at, at FreshBooks.com, or, or sorry, at, on, at Twitter, or um, you know, you can probably find me one way or another through through FreshBooks. Give us a call. You can talk to a live person on, on service and, and maybe try the software out if you're interested as well. That's uh, there's a, a free trial there if you're looking for for billing or accounting software as a small business owner. Yeah, and we'll definitely put a link in the show notes. So, Mike, thank you again so much for being here. I know it's late in Toronto. I'm wishing you the best of luck with your renovation. We just lived through a year long renovation, and I had to say stop. I'm done with that for a minute, and before we continue on, because I didn't want. I we're living in the renovation. So, anyway, thanks for everything. Wishing you the best of the rest of the year, and uh, for everyone, if you you want to drop a comment and uh, Mike and I would love to hear from you, please go ahead. And if this show has been helpful, we'd love for you to share it. So with that, God bless, go rock your day and we'll see you in the next episode.